first of all, thank you very much, sir, for accepting our invitation. Uh, oh, you're welcome. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to have you uh, speak with us. So, uh, sir, we'll have a short conversation with you regarding your work uh, related to Ramanujan's mathematics. And okay. uh, first of all, we'd like to know how you got interested into working on areas influenced by Ramanujan. No, it's a very, actually, it's a very long story. Um, I first learned about Ramanujan when I was in high school in the early 1980s. Uh, my father, who is a math professor, he just retired from Johns Hopkins. Uh, he was one of the many mathematicians who made a gift uh, that he contributed to this bust that um, that Paul Granlund uh, made of Ramanujan, and I first learned about Ramanujan because of that story. And well, to make a long story short, I never forgot about Ramanujan. I watched the Nova special, and before I knew it, I was a, a graduate student in Los Angeles in the early 1990s, and my advisor, uh, he was. He just passed away. Basil Gordon uh, was really quite a distinguished number theorist, and he talk, told me about the Rogers Ramanujan identities. And before I knew it, um, I ended up working in areas of math influenced by Ramanujan. So it was part accidental, but you know, I believe in fate. Uh, so, uh, your, was your father a big influence in your early career and your love for mathematics? Oh, absolutely. Um, if my father had been anything other than a mathematician, I'm sure I would be doing something else. Um, but as a young boy, we would travel all over the world to conferences, and um, I just fell in love with the lifestyle. My father would spend afternoons in his study with his notepad thinking, and then a couple times a year travel to exotic places, talking about things that he was passionate about. And, um, well, um, when I started college, my plan was to become a medical doctor. Um, I didn't do very well in organic chemistry, so that was the end of that. And as a, you know, so I switched to mathematics, and I haven't looked back. So my father played a very central role, uh, largely because, you know, he was following his passion, and uh, it work wasn't work for him. It was it was a love. So what kind of uh, mathematics that you do? Can you? Give you a simple example for the school students or college students. Well, yes. Um, one of the things that I really like about Ramanujan's work and the kind of number theory that I work on it's, is that it's very simple to describe. Often the proofs involve complicated objects, but the point is usually very clear. So one of my favorite functions is the function p of n, the partition function. It's a simple count. So if you were to ask um, students or anyone, in how many ways can you add up numbers to get numbers, you'd be, you'd be talking about partitions of integers. And so um, one of the functions that I'm most interested in is p of n, and it asks, in how many ways can you add up numbers to get 4 when we don't take into account reorderings? It turns out there's 5 ways. In how many ways can you add up numbers to get 6? turns out that there's 11. And these numbers, p of n, they grow at an incredible rate. They grow at an astronomical rate, and what Ramanujan was very famous for discovering in the early 20th century was he discovered some divisibility properties. It turns out that every fifth partition number, starting at four, is a multiple of five, and uh, in some of my recent work, about ten years ago, I generalized that to other moduli other than five. Ramanujan was also, together with G. H. Hardy, the first person to really come up with a, a very good theorem about the size of these numbers, and how rapidly they grow. And a few years ago, with my collaborator, Jan Brunier, we revisited the Hardy-Ramanujan formula and found a different kind of formula. And, and so my relationship to Ramanujan involves lots of things, mock theta functions, modular forms, and, and other types of objects, but perhaps my favorite one just is related to adding and counting, his, his work on the partition function. Uh, you have been a major exponent of the partition function. Uh, in recent years, you have uh, given us many outstanding results. For example, like uh, the work that you mentioned with Jen Bronier. So yes. uh, um, can you just briefly describe what is your work in that area? Ah, uh, yes. So as I said, the partition function grows at a very rapid rate. 
and Hardy and Ramanujan determined the, the the growth of P of n as n goes to infinity, um, and and so what one would like to do is find a formula, a formula where you plug in n and get back the partition number P of n. What Hardy and Ramanujan arrived at was an asymptotic, gives with very reasonable accuracy these numbers. Their work was later perfected to get a so-called exact formula for the partition numbers, where P of n is expressed as an infinite sum, uh, a convergent infinite sum, and so uh, that was the first kind of exact formula. What I did with Jan is a different kind of formula. It comes from the theory of harmonic Moss forms. We proved that the partition numbers P of n are sums of algebraic numbers. So for every n, it turns out that there's a roughly square root of n algebraic numbers that are the special values of a function that we find, which we, which is a special kind of Moss form. And our theorem is there is a universal single object, this Moss form, values and points. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I had the pleasure of listening to you in in the Ramanujan 125 conference at New Delhi. Oh yes. And, and uh, there you mentioned that uh, Ramanujan's work has applications in physics, string theory, and so on. So can you? Oh just, yes, yeah, yes, that's correct. Can you just tell us uh, in what which areas his work has influenced apart from mathematics? Well, sure. There's work of people like Samir Murthy and Dab Kolar and Zagie, who, where they've shown that you. You have um, where you can study multi-centered black holes using what are called Mach Jacobi forms. The first example of these Mach Jacobi forms were um, are Ramanujan's Mach theta functions, the formulas that Ramanujan wrote in his last letter to Hardy. There's been much work in the last year and a half in this kind of mathematics. Uh, we are now, in fact, we just finished a paper. I wrote a, written a paper with John Duncan um, and Michael Griffin. And it's it's available in the archive. It's it's about the subject of moonshine, and in it we we explain how um, there we in it we explain how the asymptotic properties of Mach modular forms are related to uh, three di three dimensional quantum gravity theory, and so it turns out that the mathematics of Ramanujan's last letter has a lot to do with qu quantum gravity. It has a lot to do with representation theory of sporadic groups like the monster. There's a so-called umbral moonshine conjecture. We've just proven that. And uh, this is all related to very stringy kinds of mathematics. So uh, what do you think was uh, the impact of uh, Ramanujan's days in India towards this mathematics? Would it have been a different mathematician if you would have got a more standard education? Oh, Manjil, that's a great question. Um, I'm so glad that you asked that question because right now, at least in the United States, um, we ex we subject our students to many tests, many examinations, and sometimes I think we're missing the point, right? Ramanujan was a two-time college dropout who was brilliant, right? And so I think that if Ramanujan were to be born today, he we would be in danger of losing his genius, right? We would be subjecting him to ordinary coursework, the ordinary regime of examinations and test scores. And, you know, to his credit, his parents continued to support him. And, you know, I had to admit, if, if that's, that's not something that we, at least in the U.S., can understand. You know, how could you continue to believe in your, you know, in your child when you don't understand what they're doing? And when all the external evidence from schools and examinations suggest the student isn't doing well. So there was something about um, the, the makeup of his family. I give his parents tremendous credit. Um, I think his strong belief in himself um, was absolutely vital. And whatever it was about you know, the environment in which he grew up, certainly I'm sure played a very important role. It's funny that you mentioned this. I'm, I'm, I'm a consultant on the movie project, The Man Who Knew Infinity. Uh, this is where Dev Patel will play um, Ramanujan and Jeremy Irons plays G.H. Hardy. Uh, before we started shooting the film, we had, we had hours of discussions about your very question. And 
you'll see when you watch the movie that there's a beautiful scene in England where where Ramanujan has a spiritual moment. He's sitting before a column design, and he has this discussion with with Hardy that says, you know, um, it is true that my mathematics is somehow divine in origin, and that um, there's this big conflict, internal and external, where Ramanujan has to l learn how to explain his ideas to Hardy, not just mathematically, but also culturally and personally. And these are things that I think would be very difficult to replicate today. So to answer your question, um, you know, I wish I had a time machine. I wish I could go back in time and sort of exhibit what the circumstances were uh, in his home because they had to have been quite special. And again, I, I, I think we have to give his parents quite a bit of credit for allowing him to pursue his mathematics when um, certainly by today's standards uh, it wouldn't make any sense to certainly to parents that I know. It wouldn't make sense to me. So, so since you mentioned the spiritual uh, incident uh, that, that you say will be there in the movie, so there has been instances in various print articles or uh, people have this sense of belief that Ramanujan was a very spirit spiritual man. In fact, uh, he he's one of his very famous quotes is that an equation has no meaning to me unless it expresses it about God. So uh, according to you, in your opinion, how, how much is it true? Well, this is a very difficult question to answer because I never, obviously, never met Ramanujan. Um, you know, I know some people believe that uh, there is no truth to the divine origin of his thoughts. Um, my answer to that is when people ask me how I personally arrive at my findings, uh, that aha moment, uh, that's still magical. I can, if you were to ask me if my work was in some way spiritual, I would have to say yes. I don't know what it is about, you know, thinking about a problem for many days or hours and then finally having a solution come to you, pop into your brain. How can that not be somehow a spiritual, at least a special moment? Whether that is related to something religious or divine, you know, I think to each his own, but certainly I think every mathematician, every theoretician, everyone who loves the arts, and everyone who loves music certainly has to agree that there is some absolutely spiritual, beyond human component to appreciating these arts and sciences. According to you, what is the single most important lesson that uh, Ramanujan's life teaches us? Ramanujan's life teaches us? Yes. Well, so that's different from um, that's not well. This is what I get from Ramanujan's life. Ramanujan, Westerner, overcame many great obstacles to become a world leader in Western science, Western mathematics. Just great distances geographically. He overcame great cultural barriers, those that I can't even begin to understand. And he did it all in a time where he was basically alone um, in England um, in his and with very few close friends. We learned from that, that's a triumph of human spirit. This was a very strong individual, very self-confident individual. And um, we can all learn from people with that, that exhibit that kind of strength. So in, the, in present day, in present day India, uh, we don't see so many brilliant mathematicians like Ramanujan. There are many, many, many well-known mathematicians in India, but still there is no one in that class. So, what do you think is lacking? Well, I, I, I would put it this way: we don't see many brilliant mathematicians like that at all ever. So, I would like to place uh, Ramanujan in the uh, group today that consists of people like Terry Tao, uh, Jean-Pierre Serre, some of the greats. Great people like this come along very infrequently. And um, when they do come along, you just have to appreciate and celebrate them for the accomplishments and achievements that they provide to the rest of us. In terms of training young students today, um, well, it is true you have to learn a body of work before you can make contributions. Um, it's, it's harder now, certainly, than in Ramanujan's day. Um, but like I said, one thing, one of the things that we should learn is that he was a, obviously a very confident, 
scientist, uh, and one who didn't follow trends. You know, he was a trendsetter. And um, maybe we need to invite our students to be a little bit more daring. Um, often our best PhD students and postdocs will work on problems which are 90% near completion when they start. If you're working towards a conjecture, there may be a large number of experts working around the question, the problem, whittling away and refining the problem so that you can really understand it. And, uh, and then conjectures are proven. Um, that's important, uh, but maybe we want to inspire some people to take some more brave, uh, a m much more brave approach to mathematics. Start at least investing some effort in terms of attacking those problems where it looks like you're running into a brick wall. We need some people to run into brick walls if we have any ever, if we are to ever break through those walls. Um, now that's, that's kind of a gamble. Um, but certainly, we need people like that, and Ramanujan was certainly someone like that. Can you describe to us a typical day of your work? A typical day? Typ <laughs> um, it's probably not very different from yours. Uh, I live in Atlanta, Georgia. It's well known for having terrible traffic. Um, so it takes me about one hour to commute to work. I come into my office. I'll, some days I lecture. On Mondays and Wednesdays, I'll either give one or two classes. And the rest of my day, um, I spent at my desk or at my blackboard, which is actually a glass board, talking to my PhD students and my postdocs. And um, apart from that, sometimes I travel. I travel quite a bit. I'll be in India, actually, as of this Sunday. Um, but my typical day is quite relaxed. I also exercise. I do, I do triathlon, so I find time to swim, bike, and run. And I have two children. My daughter is now a college student, so I don't see very much of her. My son is uh, in 10th grade in high school, so we have two more years with him. Um, but yeah, that's my days are fairly simple, I think. So what advice do you give to your uh, doctoral students or postdoctoral students when they uh, when they first come to I take, I take graduate advising very seriously. Um, there's no single speech that I give to my students. Um, I love my students. I have many of them, and um, they're very important to me. So what I like to do with my students on an individual basis is first to figure out what their skills are. There's many ways in which you can be a successful mathematician. You could be someone who invents your area. You could be someone who is continually learning, and because you ended up, have ended up learning so much, you can adapt ideas and transport them or import them into other questions. There, there are other students that are great problem solvers. That they, they just need to be presented the problems and they can solve them, uh, and so on and so forth. So one of the first things I do is I have um, I try to understand very, very clearly what uh, individual students' strengths are, I tell them what I think their strengths are, and then we discuss what would be good sorts of questions for research plans. And by the thir by the time they're a third year graduate student, we've usually come to a very clear um, we've come to an agreement about what kinds of projects they'll work on. Hopefully, there will there will already have been some papers that have been published. And the last two or three years of graduate school is about a, is about professional planning. What do you have to prove and what do you have to establish to get to the next level where your thesis makes you someone who is in demand? And so what do I tell my students? I see them every day. In fact, right before I chatted with you, we were, we were at lunch. Um, and these are the kinds of things that we talk about. So uh, according to you, how should one stu a student choose his problems? the one that he wants to work on? Oh, it, it really depends. So I've had students that ended up working in the Langlands program, people who are big picture kind of mathematicians, and there it takes great patience. You, you know, those students will read for one to two years without even attempting a problem because in, 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 in those subjects it takes um, much more a much greater investment in time before you have the right to really think about a problem. But I have other students who are, are whiz, whizzes at solving problems, right? And so 
for them, they, they might write a thesis in which they solve six or seven problems that were posed in uh, papers that number theorists have have re written recently. Um, and so, like I said, I think the most important thing is recognizing your skill. How, how patient are you? Are you a big picture mathematician? Are you a problem solver? Do you like learning something new every day? If you like learning something new every day, maybe you will be the kind of student that um, just learns so much that they place themselves in a position where they can solve problems. And so um, this, is, this is very much a case-by-case -case, um, analysis. What are some of the most outstanding unsolved problems as of today in mathematics? Oh, let's see. Well, I have very high hopes on um, what's called the twin prime problem. We now know that there are bounded gaps between primes. Uh, two years ago, we learned that there are bounded gaps about 70 million due to the great work of Tony Zhang. Um, now the bound is down to 246 uh, through the work of Polymath 8B, the crowdsourcing um, project headed by Terry Tao. And um, there's been so much great work on primes in the last year and a half. Uh, I think maybe four or five years would be, we should expect even more great theorems. In terms of, yes? I think there will be a lot of, I, in terms of other areas, I think umbral moonshine and some string theory in connection to mock theta functions, I think you'll begin to see some very, very big theorems. Um, and so, from the very classical problems and classical problems in analytic number theory to the most modern stringy type mathematics, I think, I think there'll be some big problems solved in the very near future. You mentioned the polymath project. Uh, so, uh, what do you think? Is, you mentioned the polymath project uh, yes. related yeah. to twin prime conjecture. Yeah. So, how efficient do you think uh, this kind of massively open mathematical research is? Ah, that's great. That's a great question. Um, there are certainly many math problems that cannot be um, that are not well suited for a polymath project. Um, the twin prime project, Polymath 8B, was perfect for this because the the method that was invented to s obtain bounded gaps in primes is a combination of many many different kinds of estimates and many different kinds of inequalities where individuals could be experts on one particular component and by by optimizing each of the components you arrive at this great theorem. Um, so I think problems that require, that can benefit from um, crowd sourcing, you know, um, probably are going to be problems like this. Problems where uh, a theorem is obtained by assembling many, many different lemmas and propositions where the end result is only as good as the weakest proposition. And um, so the ideas, these aren't big picture ideas. The big picture papers probably come first. Um, but in the final analysis to get the most optimal theorem, questions like this, again, problems where lots of little lemmas and propositions um, come together in a very precise way where the result is only as good as the weakest one, Maybe these are probably the kinds of problems which are best suited for polymath projects. What is your favorite mathematical result? Oh, I, I think the proof of Fermat's last theorem has to be the highlight of my mathematical career. Uh, I still like talking about it as if it was last year, um, but it, that was a great mathematical moment. So in a previous question, you mentioned uh, about the upcoming movie on Ramanujan. So oh, yes. can, you tell us, can you tell us a little more about that movie? It's going to be great. Everybody should watch it. Um, this movie is based on the famous biography by Robert Kennigal, the book The Man Who Knew Infinity. And uh, Matthew Brown, he is, he is the screenwriter and also the director for the film, adapted the book and has written a beautiful screenplay. Filming for the movie is now finished. I spent much of uh, the summer in London at the Pinewood Studios working with the actors and the art department uh, on this movie, and I think it'll be fantastic. Jeremy Irons does a great job playing G.H. Hardy. Dev Patel is a wonderful Ramanujan. There is footage actually filmed at Trinity College in Cambridge. This is the first time 
uh, filming for a major movie has ever been permitted at Cambridge, at Trinity College, so I'm very happy with that. And um, I've already seen the trailer. It's going to be fantastic, and uh, I hope you watch it. So uh, you have had a major, major role in the movie. You have been credited in, in the IMDb listings too. So what right. kind of... How was the experience overall? Uh, did you enjoy it? I, I had the time of my life. I mean, actually, I'm still working with the film. Um, I never, I, I knew nothing about making movies before this project, and I have to say, it's kind of amazing what, um, what these filmmakers can do. So, days on the set are very busy. Starts very early in the morning. There's a very tight schedule. Um, the art department is fantastic. We had one artist, uh, her name was Liz. Her one job was to master Ramanujan's handwriting and she she would reproduce, uh, she in fact reproduced 10 copies of Ramanujan's first letter to Hardy. Uh, the attention to the detail is, 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 is that specific. Um, and so I had a great time and um, I think it will be a great movie. Since you mentioned uh, Ramanujan's first letter to Hardy, so I have a question that I wanted to ask uh, to someone. Uh, oh, okay. So, so if, you, <laughs> if you get such a letter from some unknown mathematician now, would you would you read it and would you would you comment on it? Uh, very good question. Um, I do get letters occasionally from people finding new proofs of Fermat's last theorem or the Riemann hypothesis. Um, because of my experience with Ramanujan, I do take a look at these letters. Um, and I probably shouldn't admit this, but even false and very false proofs of Fermat's last theorem and the Riemann hypothesis, I will still get refereed. I will insist that somebody read these papers, uh, even though with almost absolute certainty, I, I know we'll have a mistake because they're from amateurs. I do insist that somebody read them when they're submitted to me. Please don't circulate that. I don't, I don't want to get many more of these, um, but you are right. Um, because of what I know about Ramanujan, uh, I think I'm probably among the more careful people. I, I think it is a responsibility on the part, at least my part as an editor of various journals, to make sure that each, each paper is, is evaluated. How do you see Ramanujan's work in the coming years, say 25 years from now? How do you see his work? Oh, that's a great question. Um, well, Ramanujan's work is is ubiquitous, right? People talk about the Ramanujan Peterson conjectures and analytic number theory. I'm sure 25 years from now people will still be talking about that. I think the circle method that's given rise to the exact formula for the partition numbers, people will still talk about because we're now using that in connection with math physics. Um, you know, let's see. I, my prediction is that those would probably be the two main uh, Areas of mathematics that we will still be that will still be using Ramanujan's work 25 years from now. The mock theta functions will certainly be, I think, important in 25 years. Um, maybe there will be there are some others that will 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 be as important, but certainly there will be quite a bit of work. Yeah. To someone who is a young student who wants to do something in mathematics, who wants to pursue a career in mathematics, what sort of books, books would you recommend that they read? Well, I think it would depend on the age. Uh, once a student has finished high school algebra and trigonometry, uh, I would rec I'd still recommend the great book by Hardy and Wright, The Introduction to Number Theory. These days, there's al there are also lots of high-level combinatorics books, right? Um, sub th this, these subjects are quite fashionable now, additive combinatorics. Um, and I think it's important for a young student to have some exciting uh, books like that in addition to the standard course, the standard abstract algebra, the standard analysis books. Uh, I, I would recommend a nice uh, diversified cross-section of books. For someone who is from a developing country like India, it, it's, yeah. it is sometimes very difficult to get access to the recent material, the recent uh, research material or uh, internet connectivity or something like that in the remote areas in India. Uh, at least in the, from the part of India that I come from, it is very difficult uh, to access internet or to go get books or good libraries. So in that case, how should a student 
uh, use his uh, use the resources that are already available to him to cultivate his own progress in mathematics. Okay, that's very difficult for me because I live in a situation where I have the internet in my pocket, right, with a cell phone, um, and I have access to great libraries. Some of the books that I've described are um, are quite old. The, the books by Hardy and Wright, they've been around for decades. So I would hope that uh, a, a local school library would have those books. So for a student, um, having access to the most recent, the most cutting edge mathematics probably isn't so so vital because at a young age you want to be inspired and it, you don't have to read about the latest work to be inspired by progress in mathematics. So some of the books I've described, for example, Hardy and Wright is a classic and I would hope that a student could find those books. Then the next best thing is to try to find a local mentor, a local college, a lo local math teacher because the more people you know who have access to these, these you know, the, the internet and, and books, uh, the more opportunities a student's going to end up getting. And so um, I would hope that, that, that there's such facilities and such opportunities in place, even in, even in rural India. So I will be in Kumbakonam in, what, 10 days? And even there, you can go to government college and find books. Um, and, you know, this is, uh, I think we have the internet at the hotel. Maybe it's spotty, but, um, but it is true that I would hope that the internet becomes, you know, readily available in India, and I and I hope that happens in the near future. Uh, the final question: So, okay. which is your most favorite uh, Ramanujan result? Result of Ramanujan. My favorite Ramanujan result. It would. Uh, I I don't know that I could pick uh, one favorite one. I would probably pick three topics. One would be his study of congruences for the partition function and his tau function. That's given birth to so much beautiful mathematics. It in, even inspired Serre when he developed the theory of Galois representations, which was uh, assembled by Deligne in his Fields Medal work. Secondly, I'd probably say his development of the circle method with Hardy. This is um, one of the crowning achievements of classical number theory, certainly of its day. People still use it. And thirdly, it's his work on the mock theta functions. If Ramanujan's last letter to Hardy had never been received, then I'm not sure what I would be doing right now. So I've spent the last five or six years uh, studying those works and developing it in a more modern perspective. And the applications, um, there's so many applications. We're actually writing a book. I'm writing a book with Amanda Folsom, of Yale and Katrin Bringman of Cologne. Uh, I think it's going to be 600 pages and it's going to be on mock modular forms and their applications. And um, so I have to say the three, my three favorite um, contributions, Ramanujan's theory of congruences for P of N and tau of N, his work, two, his work on the circle method with Hardy, and three, his imagination in terms of seeing that there is a theory of mock theta functions. All fantastic works. Thank you very much, Professor Ono, for your time. Very much, Joel. It was my pleasure. Okay, have a good day. You too. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.